Tonight we're going to talk about Jesus in the way of him being the cornerstone of our communities. We're going to talk a little bit in Ephesians and we're going to move around through some of the scriptures going into areas Timothy and Matthew and Acts. So we're going to bounce around a little bit tonight. Um, but our primary verse that we're going to talk tonight, the passage is going to be out of Ephesians chapter 2. So if you can open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 22. Paul writes here that, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The book of Ephesians is probably my favorite book of the Bible, uh, the New Testament anyway. Uh, it's a message from Paul uh, to the church of Ephesus explaining their identity in Christ, which is timeless because it also explains our identity in Christ. He wrote a great message here explaining to them of God's grace and love. And through that, there's a harmony in that message that gives us the message of the privileges that, of the life that we are found in union with Christ and brought us today through the Holy Spirit. Looking at this passage here that Paul wrote, he's discussing um, a part of what they call the then and now message. Um, in the beginning of chapter 2, he talks about being then dead in sins and now alive in Christ. In the second part here, 18 through 20, he talks about then being the life of pre-salvation and moving to the life now which we have in Christ. Paul's reminding them, as he reminds us, that we are no longer lost in the world, but we're found. We're found in Christ, who is the cornerstone of everything that we are and everything we're part of, our family lives, our work lives, and within our church. Through this message that Paul writes us, um, you can really look at it as three different areas. Uh, broke it down to uh, a couple of different parts. The first being verses 18 and 19 where he says, For through him we have access in one spirit to the Father. For then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Paul's telling us here that we are one in Christ that we have access in one spirit to the Father. Through Jesus Christ, we have access to that Father, through Him and only Him. And He reminds us of this when He says in, Jesus, in John 14, 6 and 7, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If He had known me, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. For now, on you, you yeah, do you know Him and have seen Him? That nap screwed me up today. <laughs> Uh, so here Jesus is reminding us that with him, he made us equal one through him as one community, of one unity, as one unison in, as Christians. We have full access to the Father in him because of that unity. He tells us that we are no longer strangers and aliens. We're, because of that salvation that he freely provided to us, his grace has allowed us to be no longer set apart from him, but in fellowship with him in the community, we are one family. We're no longer trespassers. We're no longer transients. We are no longer trespassers. We are one in him. We are citizens with the saints. We are unified with all the saints of the past. We are united with other Christians. We are united as one as the universal church. We all are united around that one cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. He continues on to talk about members of the household of God. Here at that point in time, Paul was talking about the Jews and the Gentiles no longer being identities of their own, but being identified as one, as one family in that united through Christ, that they have found new life in a new family, in a new community of Christ. He goes on to talk about that household of God in a way that he's reminding them, as he reminds us, that it's a group of people. We're not... A household and just a building. We're not, the church is not just a household. It's the body of Christ, the body of believers, the body of the faithful that makes up that household. We are united in the saints in that household, whether the past, the present, or the future. 
through Christ being the center. He goes on to verse 20 and says that built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being that cornerstone. The message uh, translation of the Bible loosely translates this to say, he used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. Each one of you as believers of Christ is a stone in that foundation that continues to build every single day as more and more come to the faith of Christ. Every one of us is part of the bricks that build that foundation of Christianity, that, uh, our faith. And as members of that foundation, as the members of that house, we continue to grow and strengthen it, and strengthen it in him and for him. Paul wrote that we built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. As we become Christians, it is important to understand that we are immediately part of that foundation, as I just mentioned. We are building from back when the apostles and the prophets first started the foundation of the early church from the direct messages of Christ through to today and continuing that building of his, his earthly buildings as we move forward for the glory of the kingdom. Jesus goes on to say, uh, Paul rather goes on to say that Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone. He is the direct and only connection we have with the Father. And through that, because of that, he is also the united and single connection that we have to other Christians. It's, he unites us. He is that cornerstone, that linchpin that keeps us all together. We all come together for him. We're here as Christians because of Christ. The Greek word for cornerstone is actually a two-part word. It's kephal... Yeah, kephale gonia, sorry, um, which literally means the head or corner of an angle. It's retranslated in the cornerstone here in Ephesians, but it's also found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even in 1 Peter. Uh, the cornerstone that they're referencing is uh, throughout the scriptures, it talks about Jesus, is relation to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ being um, a figurehead or an important part or that, that capstone um, of creation. And to put that in a little bit of context, during Peter, uh, Paul's time, a cornerstone was a celebrated piece of a building. On any public building, any building of significance in a town, uh, they would place a cornerstone as a ceremony. They actually would celebrate it more and be more focused on the cornerstone than they would be the foundation or other parts of the building. Uh, the one that's on the screen is one that was placed... Uh, sometime in 60, 70 AD, that was named after a um, figurehead of the city was placed in. And it was common to have ceremonies and naming the cornerstone because of the, they they recognize the significance of that. Uh, throughout the New Testament, we hear that and see that um, the foundation is cycles around that cornerstone of Christ. Without the cornerstone of Christ, the foundation of Christianity, the foundation of our faith can't exist and the temple could not be built. Verses 21 and 22 move on to say that in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the Holy Spirit of the Lord, and in him you are also being built together in the dwelling place for the God the Spirit. Jesus joins us all together, and that's the theme of him being the cornerstone is that he joins us together. As the cornerstone, he is what binds us. He is what builds us, and that's how we should be building our communities. We build it outwardly through our evangelistic means or inwardly in our personal lives. He joins us together so we can grow into the holy temple of the Lord. In this statement here, Paul is reminding us that the church is, the church is a living and dynamic thing. It grows in a daily. It grows through us. It grows through his people. We help grow that through our discipleships, through our bringing of others into his community. As such, being built stone by stone and brick by brick, we are those living stones. We are continuing to build with cornerstone, that cornerstone being Jesus Christ. Finally, he says that in him you are built together in the dwelling of the places of the God of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 tells us that the Lord dwells in us and walks in us, his living church. This place of the Holy God, the Holy place for God by the Holy Spirit is the living church that we're helping continue to build today and today and for the future. 
through this, he's telling, Paul's telling us that God's grace, through being one in him, allows us to continue in his community and be part of his community with Christ as the cornerstone. His grace has provided salvation to us. It's provide, it brings life to us, and it allows us to live in glory and honor him. It is his house of which we dwell, and we, allow to continue, we continue to build as part of him having him as the cornerstone. Paul provided this message to us as much as he did to them in Ephesians. And I sit here and I say it's timeless. The idea that Christ is the cornerstone is fundamental to us. Without that, we, we are not united in him. We, are lo- we stay that lost that Paul talks about in that then and now. We're lost, but then we're saved. We're saved through him. That salvation, that blessings he's provided us, allows us to be part of his community. We're bonded with him in relationship with him. We're not just meant to bond with him and bond with other Christians, but we're called to bond with all people. We're called to bring others into the community of Christ. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, that go into the world and proclaim the gospel of the whole creation. Matthew 28 tells us of the Great Commission to go out and make disciples for him. He wants us to share him. He wants us to know him personally. He wants us to know him intimately. He wants us to live with him as the center of our lives and go out and share that with others. We're called to know him, to love him, to obedient to him, but we are also commanded to go out and share him. We are called to bring the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ in all communities of our life. So understanding that and understand what Paul's talking here in, in Ephesians, what's it look like? What does it mean for Jesus to be the cornerstone of our communities. We talk often of us as Christians out in the out, outside community, going out, doing outreach, doing evangelism, doing uh, projects for the neighborhood so they can see Christ actively as the outward church. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about our inward communities, our families, our personal work lives, and even the church inside itself. In Acts 4, 11, and 12, Peter tells Jesus tells us that Jesus, who was rejected as the cornerstone, is binds what binds us through the salvation of the Lord. He's quoted saying, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has come, become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under the heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This message is given again and again, found in Mark 12, uh, 21, uh, Matthew 21, Mark 12, Luke 20, and it all goes back to a, a prophecy that was placed in Psalms 118.22 where it says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. They knew then that somebody was coming that was going to unite us and bring us all together as one. one to, for him to be the cornerstone of our communities, it means that we must place him, the cornerstone, as the cornerstone of the foundation of all areas of our lives, whether it's Again, family, work, or the church. Whether it's, uh, we're commanded through uh, the scriptures in 1 Timothy 4, 11 and 12, command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers as an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Jesus expects us to place him at the center of our lives. He expects us to be the center of how we build our relationships, how we connect with others, how we represent ourselves to others. Because when we rep- are representing ourselves, we should be representing Him. They should be seeing Him, not us. We need to strive to make our lives, in our personal lives and in our communities, to be Christ-centric. We must reflect Jesus in all of our actions, all our abilities, all our relationships, and everything that we do. There's an anonymous quote, it's, I've heard it in several different versions, but the one that I picked was that you may only be the Jesus some people ever see. There, and I was going to look this up this afternoon, there's been studies recently that have said that there's more non-believers, Christian believers in the United States than believers now. Recently, uh, there was a study that came out that said that there's more non-believers in Maine than there are believers in Maine. We need to, as Christians, 
represent him in the community because we need to show him. We're commanded to show him. John the Baptist provided wisdom in this realm when he said we should be growing in Christ. And he says in John 3.30, we must increase, but I must decrease. Those around us should see Christ in us. He should see less of our human condition and our humanity and more with him as we grow. We should, be, they, we should be showing that we are living with and we are becoming more like him. We should be striving to be like him. John 17 and 18, Jesus says, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Them is us. We're being sent out as his messengers to display him in our communities. Through our actions, through our words, through the way we live life. Genesis tells us we are image bearers in the Lord. And that in that role as an image bearer, we should be emanating the image of Christ in all things that we do in our community. Three areas of community I want to talk about. The first one is the community of our family. Christ needs to be central in our community of our family. As Christians, we need to place Christ in the way we live life, and how we raise our kids, how we act as husbands, how we act as wives, how we act as mothers and fathers. We're told in Ephesians 5.25, as husbands, we need to love our wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself up for her. We also are told in Colossians 3.19 that husbands love your wives and not be harsh with them. As husbands, we need to live as Christ expects us and to guide, allow Christ to guide our love for our wives. For our wives, Christ should be guiding you for your love for your husbands. Proverbs 31 explains the picture of a godly wife and how a godly wife is presented in the word of the Lord. Our children, it tells us that children should obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right, Ephesians 6.1. And that even in Exodus 20.12, the basic commandment is, honor your father and your mother. As children, we, we are expecting them to grow in the Lord, and it is our job as parents to grow them, to help them emanate the community of Christ. As mothers and fathers, we are told in Proverbs 22, 6, that to allow God to guide you in raising children, you to train up your child in a way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We're told in Ephesians 6, 4, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We are to emanate Christ inwardly in our families. We are to place Christ as the cornerstone of our families, and by doing that, we live our lives more for Him and less for us. We allow our community of family to circle around Him. It'll be Him as central. Him is that, that building block, that foundational building block of which all that we do will allow us to grow in our, in our life with Him, grow in a life with each other, and to grow our children to be good and faithful servants of the Lord as we are called to be. Another community that I want to talk about is our community of work. Some of us love our jobs. Some of us don't love our jobs. Okay? Some of us go to work every day happy and singing and whistling and are very happy to go do what they do. Others not so much. Whether you lay sidewalks for a living, do taxes, fight fires, ride an ambulance, do work at a bank, play, do finances. We are called to show Jesus in our work. We are called to be that emanation of Christ even in the workplace. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 10.31, so wherever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all in the glory of God. Colossians 3.23 tells us, whatever you do, do it work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. I gave, gave rough facts earlier that uh, there's more non-believers than believers in a lot of the areas of our lives. I work in a firehouse. My full-time job is I'm a firefighter paramedic. And you want to talk about a community of work that almost blares into a community of family. I spend some more time with those guys than I do my own family some weeks. Even in that role, I need to emanate Christ as a, as a human, as a child of God. Whether I am being compassionate to my patients, whether I'm being 
compassionate to somebody that just lost their home, whether I'm showing the love and grace that, that he calls for me to emanate in all situations, even in the firehouse when we're having downtime, when I'm spending time with them talking about their brothers, their sisters, their family lives, what's going on with Joe's wife, what's going on with Sarah's husband, what's going on with Cindy's kids. I am called to act and display Christ there. I can tell you that in the firehouse, there's a lot less believers than there are uh, non-believers. In that role, we are expected, whether it's at my firehouse or at your workplace, to show him, to glorify him, to honor him, make him the cornerstone even there in where we work, to glorify him and to show others him in the call to bring others to him and grow them for him. The last place I want to talk about is the cornerstone of our church community. Without a doubt, we must have Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of our church community. Without a doubt, we fail as a church when we no longer hold Jesus Christ as that cornerstone of our community. Everything we do, whether it's ministry, whether it's leadership, whether it's worship, serving in small groups, leading small groups, leading prayer groups, our 50s plus ministries, our Bible study ministries. Every group, every sub-community of our church community, everything that we stand upon must hold Jesus Christ as that cornerstone. If Jesus Christ isn't the cornerstone in those areas and we're not living for Christ in those areas, how can we show the outward communities what Jesus means? how he's affected our lives, how he's affected how we are, what we do. Our church community is different from all others because he unites us. We hold him one thing in common. At the firehouse, we hold all kinds of other things in common, but not, usually not Christ. In church, we all share Christ. I was blessed to come to this church a year ago. Uh, my family and I, pre-pandemic, had some lower other blessings that came along um, to introduce us into Summit. Um, my kids went to Camp 207 two years ago, uh, came home, and Pastor Travis was uh, doing worship there, and he, they came and said, hey, we got to go to this church. When the, the, he talks to us. we got to go there. Kind of blew it off. We were in a good season in our other church. We were happy. We were comfortable. We were serving life for Christ. We were, had Christ as our cornerstone in our ministries that we were serving there. Fast forward a year, my kids go back off to Camp 207. They come back and say, look, you know, listening to us. We got to go listen to this guy. He talks to us. We want to listen to him. We're, we, this is where we want to be. At that time of our life, things were starting to slow down. It was pre-COVID. Uh, some of our ministries have kind of got onto cruise control. So we're like, all right, we'll pray on it. Fast forward through the winter, uh, a lot of things changed, a lot of things kind of dust settled. We prayed on it a lot. We kept asking for a sign to kind of tell us where God wanted us to go for ministry from there. March, the week before COVID hit, I'm down in Massachusetts with my family. We're down at Great Wolf Lodge, of all places, in the middle of Massachusetts, well away from here. And in the pool area comes this big, tall guy with his family. Travis, Kristen, and the kids just happened to walk in, of all places, Massachusetts. I looked at Katie and said, I think that's the sign we've been looking for. Um, got talking, promised each other we'd meet up for coffee. Um, coffee didn't happen because COVID hit. Now, Travis and I hit it off um, after, somewhere in between all that um, in a different church setting. We met together. He's a Liberty alumni. I go to Liberty. At that point, I had just graduated, so we had a lot to talk about. Sports, not so much. That commu that's a whole other community that we could talk about is where Christ fits into sports. Um, but fast forward to COVID, we started looking at church, our church community and this church community, and ultimately, the Lord placed us and blessed us here to come here in the new season into this church of which we need to, we as a community hold Jesus as that cornerstone. And I am blessed and, and blessed that you guys have welcomed me and my family as you did into this church. Because here, in, in our communities, and in what we do here, and what we do in all our other ministries, we hold Jesus as that cornerstone. We serve to and exalt Him in the Great Commission. And that's what we're called to do. 
We're called, whether we're sitting here on a Sunday morning, sitting here on a Sunday evening on a beautiful Sunday as this, on the Tuesday mornings that we come in for Bible study, or Wednesday night, the prayer groups, that we stay obedient to Him. We place Him at that center, Him as that cornerstone, and exalt Him and honor Him and obey Him. And in such, we can ch- that changes our lives and grows us in Him so we can go out and show Him in our communities that we go out into or to take home to our, home, our families, our works, the firehouse, the ball fields. So I got the one thing that underlies all this is Jesus and that He must hold the place of the cornerstone in every area of what we do. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then the worship team is going to come up. The first is this. Is Jesus the cornerstone of your communities? What would it look like if we put Jesus in the center of every community we're part of? What would it look like if we built our communities around the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ? Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for giving us Jesus Christ, of which that we can place at the cornerstone of all that we do, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be in relationship with you, Lord, and serve you and be obedient to you, and through Christ, go forth and show your glories. Lord, I ask that as we all walk out of here tonight, Lord, that we all look at how we can further place you, your son, Jesus Christ, at the cornerstone of all the communities that we are part of and at the life that we live, Lord, here on earth. Lord, I pray to you that each one of us's hearts are for you, Lord, and that each one of us grow closer to you and show others who you are through us. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the magnificent things that you do for us, Lord, and allow us to continue to serve you and be obedient to you. In your name we pray, amen.